I am not sorry, because I think we have really good stuff to do this afternoon, and we're going to get started already. Uh, I, I mistakenly left someone out of our legislative guests. So Miriam Farouk from Assemblymember Mullen's office, are you here? Yay! Thank you so much for joining us. Wonderful. So while you are enjoying uh, your lunch, uh, we are going to get on with the program. And so I would like to begin our lunch keynote with an introduction of Kenji Trainer, who is the Director of Strategic Grant Making at the Sobrato Family Foundation, where he leads all of the foundation's grant making and provides strategic leadership for the foundation's efforts and has had a big focus on education initiatives, including English learner education. So he's also, as though he doesn't have enough to do, he's also the co-founder and board chair of Next Generation Scholars, an educational nonprofit that serves disadvantaged youth and families in Marin County. So please give, uh, ten, please give Kenji a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Camille, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm very grateful to John, Carla, Vicky, uh, the entire team at Advancement Project for organizing this important event and for the privilege to speak with you all briefly today. The Sobrato Family Foundation uh, is primarily a place-based funder in Silicon Valley. Uh, we are very focused on educational equity issues for low-income students and English learner students, most of whom, of course, are students of color. Uh, we believe very deeply in the potential of all children, and we have engaged in a wide range of activities to expand opportunity for students and families to experience an affirming and high-quality education that leads to success in college and career. Uh, that trajectory, of course, begins in early education uh, from infancy onward. And we really believe that children must benefit from a system of education that views their language, their culture, their family and community as assets, both in early education and in K-12. Uh, the Sobrato Family Foundation has sought to enact these deep beliefs and values um, through the Sobrato Early Academic Language Model, which we call the SEAL model. It was designed by Dr. Lori Olson and uh, is currently being led by Dr. Anya Hurwitz. Um, through the SEAL model, we've partnered with more than 20 K-12 districts and early education program partners to implement this model in 100 school sites across California, including here in the Sacramento Capital Region, the Bay Area, the Central Valley, as well as Los Angeles. And in addition to uh, this direct work with local systems and teachers, students, and families, we're also very keenly aware of the broader ecosystem and the need for conversations like today uh, focused on policy, advocacy, and public awareness, really striving uh, so that together we can build a, a, a more highly effective, inclusive, and accessible set of educational opportunities for California's children, um, more than half of whom, of course, uh, under the age of five are coming from families that speak a language other than English. So for our foundation over the next 10 years, it's really our goal to continue uh, to expand the SEAL model um, and through policy and advocacy and partnership to try and reshape early education in K-12 so that dual language learners and English learner students are fully embraced, supported, and celebrated as a vibrant population in our schools, in communities, and of course throughout society. Uh, the Sobrato Family Foundation is a fairly small foundation, but we have a deep commitment and passion for this kind of work. Uh, we are so pleased to be partners in this collective effort with everyone here today. Uh, and we look forward to continue working alongside you for years to come. And of course, as we all consider how to navigate making this kind of social change around issues of race, culture, and language, it's really a treat that we get to hear from Sonia Manzano, whose life and work is a positive and powerful example uh, of success in impacting the lives of young children. Um, as you heard, uh, Ms. Sonia Manzano has inspired and educated and delighted children um, and families uh, through her work on Sesame Street as Maria, 
Uh, she's been named one of the 25 greatest Latina role models ever, has won 15 Emmys for her work writing on Sesame Street, was also part of the writing team for the Peabody award-winning children's series, Little Bill, uh, just a tremendous advocate um, and champion for, for children. So before we hear from Ms. Manzano, we'd like to play a short video that captures her tremendous work and leadership. Please join me in warmly welcoming Ms. Sonia Manzano. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, don't. Thank you so much. It's, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Um, uh, I, I can't begin my comments without, of course, mentioning the latest tragedy in the United States in, in Las Vegas. And I know that, that all of our thoughts and prayers are with those people. And I also hope that everyone takes the opportunity to, um, to contact your representative and let them know uh, uh, how you feel. Thank you. Um, I was promised you were going to be done eating by the time I started, but uh, I guess uh, that didn't happen. But we'll do the best that we can. That was my life on Sesame Street. You just saw 44 years of being on Sesame Street compressed into three seconds. Thank you. I've, I've led a double life on Sesame Street for over 44 years. The real life of Sonia Manzano, wife, mother, actress, author, and the fantasy life of Maria on Sesame Street. Wife, mother, fix-it shop owner, and toaster fixer. As you know, I've actually uh, fixed the same toaster for over 44 years. <laughs> Maria's life and my life have run uh, neck and neck, and they intertwine. Incredibly enough, I am not schizophrenic. Uh, Sesame Street has been around long enough for me to get married uh, and have a baby on the show who is now 29 years old. I've met my closest friends on Sesame Street and lost, uh, uh, lost two of my closest friends. As a matter of fact, Maria's life and Sonia's life has been presented in such detail, I often refer to us as the first uh, reality show <laughs> without the whining. Let me clear up my marital state as a lot of people think that I was really married. I don't need this at the moment, thank you. A lot of people thought that uh, uh, my marriage to Emilio Delgado was real and that I am married to him. Um, uh, Emilio and I were once traveling together and we were recognized by a fan who was so thrilled she came up to us and gushed and said how wonderful it was that her children should see real love on television. <laughs> well, we had to tell her that the truth. We told her that we weren't married and she sucked in her breath and said, well, as long as you really love each other. <laughs> You may or may not know uh, that I recently retired from Sesame Street, and I joke saying that I retired because 44 years was long enough for me to wait for Oscar the Grouch to propose. <laughs> I casually mentioned my retirement when I was introducing my memoir at a librarian's association two years ago, uh, Becoming Maria, Love and Chaos in the South Bronx, and the librarians and teachers tweeted the information, and by the time I got back to New York, my retirement had made uh, uh, national news, so uh, don't underestimate the power of teachers and librarians. I could not have paid for so much coverage. Still, you might, you might 
wonder how I could have stayed on a show for so long. How many different ways can you teach the alphabet? How can I correct the, all the characters about the very same things? Well, the reason that I was able to stay so long on Sesame Street was that every generation gave us a new opportunity to get things right. I'll never forget the first time I saw Sesame Street. I walked into the student union of Carnegie Mellon University, and there on the screen, a black and white television, was a very young, very bald James Earl Jones reciting the alphabet in a very deliberate manner. A, B, C, D, as the letters flashed over his head. Well, it was so compelling, I thought that I was watching a show that taught lip reading. <laughs> but then, what really shocked me was when they cut to the street and I see Susan and Gordon, this warm, friendly, cheerful, African-American couple that was so, so real. And I was amazed. And it's hard for me to get this across to audiences today, but in 1969, you didn't see any people of color on television. And if you did, they certainly weren't this warm, friendly couple like Susan and Gordon. Our first target audience were underserved African-American children in poor areas. That's why they had Susan and Gordon. And then when Latino groups demanded representation, thank you, thank you, thank you, Emilio Delgado and I got cast as Luis and Maria. Now this had special meaning for me. I'm Puerto Rican, born and raised in the South Bronx in the 50s, and I watched a lot of television as a kid, and I never saw anybody who looked like me or lived in a neighborhood similar to the one that I lived in. So retiring from the show has made me reflect on the early days of Sesame Street. It came out of the turbulent 1960s. It was a youth-driven culture in America. It was idealistic. Nobody trusted anybody over the age of 35. Technology was in the dark ages. There was no internet, no DVD, no on demand. We couldn't even refer to colors on Sesame Street. You couldn't say, oh, Big Bird, your yellow feathers are so pretty because not everybody had a color television set. We were influenced by the Civil Rights Movement, by Martin Luther King Jr., and by Malcolm X. Women wanted to join the workforce for the very first time, and they burned their bras in protest. I guess now we'll burn our spanxes. <laughs> Except, ladies, they don't burn. I tried drying a pair in the hotel room with a hair dryer, and I almost set the alarm off. Everybody had a political platform. Everybody, so much so that I thought Emilio Delgado was an activist before I realized he was an actor because as a supporter of Cesar Chavez and the National Farm Workers Association, he would pin a boycott grapes button on everybody he came into contact with. It wasn't until later that I realized he was a performer. Head Start, that wonderful children's initiative that helped us see young kids in a new way came out of that era, the late 60s. Uh, let me read a little bit of the original proposal that Sesame Street sent to the Rockefeller Foundation in order to get funds for the show. I quote, it is becoming obvious that no one knows what the world is going to be like for the younger to live in it. So perhaps the kindest thing we can do is to try not to burden them with the quaint details of today's beliefs and customs, but just attempt to get across a few principles of how things interact what is basic in human life and to acquaint them with as thorough a cross-section as possible of persons, places, and things as they now stand. After this, we can only give them a pat on the shoulder and wish them well." Unquote. The idealistic idea behind the show was that with improved self-esteem and armed with cognitive skills, underprivileged kids would start school on the same level as their middle class peers, giving them an equal shot of succeeding in our society. And it wasn't just cognitive skills we wanted to illuminate. I was most proud to be part of Sesame Street when we tackled the death of Mr. Hooper, our beloved cast member, Will Lee. He passed away and uh, we needed a way to explain his absence. Well, 
Goodbye Mr. Hooper has become a classic of Sesame Street and it was the first of many shows designed to help children get through trauma. A season of hurricanes inspired programming that people are looking at today because we are in another season of hurricanes. Uh, there are military family uh, videos and, and most recently an incarceration video to help children deal with the trauma of having a parent in jail. Recently, the show had an autistic Muppet make its debut. Still, we could not. I will pass it on to the people who did that. Still, we could not have imagined 9-11, and Sesame Street even came up with a video to help children get through that. Kids believe in the Muppets as much as they believe in Lisa and Maria are really married. As a matter of fact, we once had a four-year-old in the studio, and unbeknownst to Carol Spinney, who plays Big Bird, the four-year-old saw Carol take the top half of his suit off. No worries, at which point the kid turned to me and said, Maria, does Big Bird know there's a man in him? <laughs> I joined Sesame Street's grand experiment in the late 80s as a writer, and I began by questioning the Hispanic content in our scripts. I thought there were better and more interesting ways of showing our culture than food, guitars, congas, and language. So at a time when there were very few women writers in the Writers Guild on television, and no Latinos at all, I decided to try, and I was su successful. I became a writer, and as you heard, I've er garnered 15 Emmys as part of the writing staff. Thank you. Thank you, now I need my clicker here. My retirement from the show has prompted many personal questions. A recurring one to myself is, can you tell me how I got, how I got to Sesame Street in the first place? Good luck good timing, perhaps being in the right place at the right time during this upheaval of social and cultural change. I don't know, but if you had suggested to me when I was a kid in the South Bronx that I was gonna end up on television, I would have suggested you commit yourself to the nearest insane asylum. That is how far out that idea was. Looking back over that journey, uh, the examination of my journey to Sesame Street and the desire to know where I went right and where I went wrong when I could have taken so many paths res resulted in my memoir, Becoming Maria, Love and Chaos in the South Bronx before I came Maria. My, my outcome is unbelievable to me because I had an inferior elementary school education and because my parents lived a tumultuous lifestyle a deadly combination if you are looking to succeed. That little girl on the jacket is not me, but she certainly could be me. That's me uh, an, as an adorable uh, four-year-old with my parents at an amusement park on Sunday, which we had to get dressed up for and not get dirty just because we had come from church, even though we were at an amusement park. My mother in Puerto Rico, my father, I guess I'm at a wedding in that fussy dress down there. Uh, a hot tween on a park bench in Cretona Park. My little brother, and down there with my big sister, Aurea, I actually remember that white bathing suit. The expression on my sister's face is the expression she had her whole entire life. My sister was born angry and continues to be so. <laughs> That's a picture of my high school graduation where I wanted to be a beatnik and I held my hair back in a bun. Down here in the class picture, I wanted to look like Kim Novak because I loved the movie Vertigo and wore my hair in a French twist. And up at the top, I, I'm sure I made an extra hole in the ozone layer with all the amount of hairspray <laughs> I needed to keep those, those curls in place. But the fa pictures that really fascinated me were these two of my mother and sister in Puerto Rico. There's uh, my mother looking so sharp with her little peplum peplum dress and her little shoes, and, and she looks like Cary Grant is about to come pick her up in his car. 
and I wondered how could she look so nice and live in that terrible mean shack. And I was, I was amazed at that picture of my sister. She looked so nice and neat with her little Mary Jane shoes. When I happened to know that that boardwalk was built over a sewage system in which children would drown on a regular basis. Well, my parents uh, would talk about these terrible, horrible uh, uh, situations of poverty that they had escaped from. And I would be drawn to these pictures to examine them because I had never been to Puerto Rico. I was only born here uh, and didn't know their past. And then after they would tell up these terrible stories of poverty, it would make them nostalgic for the island. And then they'd bring out their guitars and sing beautiful songs about Puerto Rico and how lovely the weather was. And uh, of course, all our hopes and prayers are with the Puerto Ricans there now. But anyway, I was confused because it, as a kid, I would think, what, which is it? Is it a good place or a bad place? If it was so good, why did we leave? And why am I here? And it's not so good here. So I share this with you because I know that you are dealing with children who have a foot in two different cultures and uh, have to make their way while having that balancing act. The short of it is that my parents migrated from Puerto Rico uh, after World War II, and they be my father uh, worked on roofs and my mother was a seamstress in a factory and they began their struggle. They struggled with the system. They struggled with the speaking English. They struggled so much that the term for la lucha, the struggle, peppered their everyday conversation. When people would come over, they'd say, how are you? They'd say, here we are in la lucha. <laughs> when they answered the phone, they would say, here we are in la lucha. But mostly they struggled with each other. My mother struggled with my father's violent, drunken tirades. And my father, I suppose, as an adult, I can look back, I know he struggled with inner demons. So theirs was a cyclical story of domestic violence replaced by hope and reconciliation, replaced by domestic violence, replaced by hope again. As a child, I looked to television to find sanctuary. I longed for the lifestyles that I saw on Leave It to Beaver and Father Knows Best, those shows you could see on TV land. I even loved this twisted game show called Queen for a Day, where the winner would be the woman with the most miserable life. For a thrilling half hour, three contestants would tell their tales of woe. Some had children who needed wheelchairs. Others needed a place to live because their houses had been washed away. Mean husbands had abandoned the family. After these tired women told their stories, the host would hold his hand over their heads, and according to a pl an applause meter, and the women would be crying, Ooh, they picked the winner. The winner would get a washer dryer, because it was brought to you by General Electric. Electric, or whatever it was that they wanted. And I used to like this show because it validated misery. And I felt I wanted my mother's misery to have a reason for its existence. I even loved Romper Room, even though at the end of the show she'd say, she'd look into the camera, the host would look into the camera and say, I see, I see Barbara and Bobby, and I was always waiting for her to say, I see Juan and Maria, but she never did. I also found comfort in Bronx schools. They had a tracking system in place. If you were sick or had emotional problems or didn't speak English, you were put in the slow learners class. There was no bilingual classes, and I remember one sad event. Uh, there was a moment when my peers made fun of incoming Dominican students because they didn't speak English and they had to be put back a grade, which was what they did for any kid who came in from Puerto Rico. One of the few African-American teachers in the school confronted them. She was livid. She let them know that in fact, those children were a year ahead of us. It just so happened that they knew the curriculum in Spanish. Well, unfortunately, in those days, there was no bilingual mechanism for these kids to, to help these kids get over the hump. But I'm so glad that teacher had the wherewithal to scold the students who made fun of those uh, children who did not speak English uh, yet. 
Well, getting back to my story, I spoke English and I was smart, so I was put in the smart class my whole educational career. I did very well with minimum effort because very little was expected of me. I could paint my nails at my desk, dry my hands, and still ace all of the classes. But suddenly, a teacher helped me get into the High School of Performing Arts, and I was in for the shock of my life. That's that specialized high school, the fame school. It was a TV show, it was a movie. Well, when I was faced with middle-class kids, my grades went from an A-plus in the Bronx to a C-minus at the High School of Performing Arts. I used to think, how could I be so, so smart in the Bronx and so stupid in Manhattan? I could not compete with middle-class kids who had superior elementary school education. When I was faced with a group of thinking teenagers at performing arts who were used to expressing themselves and giving their opinions, I was challenged. And I know now that poor kids are taught to behave, be quiet, stay out of the way, and memorize. My friend, and I'm dropping names, Supreme Court Justice, the other Sonia from the Bronx, Sonia Sotomayor, says that when she was a top student at a rigorous Catholic school, and even she had to hone up on her writing skills when she got accepted into Princeton. Well, getting back to me now, with a C average, going to college was going to be a challenge. I didn't have the grades or the recommendations from teachers, so I ignored the guidance teacher and applied to schools I could audition for. So I got into Carnegie Mellon University the very same way kids get into schools on sports scholarships. I think about the impact my culture had on my, my education and I realized that I was raised to be obedient. It was an attractive quality in a girl. I was 10 years old before I realized it was okay to ask a question. How could I when my mother told me I was never supposed to look an adult in the eye? So I can't tell you how many times teachers would say to me, look at me when I'm talking to you, and I'm thinking, I can. My mother told me I, I don't know what to do. It was during math class and I simply had to ask a question and I, a question burst out and I thought, oh my God, this is the end of my life. It's gonna go on my permanent record, which doesn't is, exist. And the incredible happened. The teacher answered the question and my world opened up. The impact of culture on education is told very beautifully in the movie Real Women Have Curves. Uh, it's the story of a Mexican-American girl who gets a full scholarship to Columbia University. She lives in, Cal in L.A. Her parents don't want her to accept because they are so closely knit, they don't want her to leave home. Well, I left that movie thinking, great movie, but it's unrealistic. What parent doesn't want their kid to accept a full scholarship to an Ivy League school? Right after that, I was asked to give a talk to a small Texas uh, community uh, in southern Texas to kids and parents who were dealing with that very issue. They lived in such closely knit supportive families. The parents had trouble allowing their kids to leave, even to accept good scholarships and go or accept generous uh, internships. The kids felt they were abandoning their parents if they left. So we have to get people used to the idea that one can leave home to go to school and still maintain a close relationship with your family. Of course, the children that this particular group is dealing with is not interested in leaving home. And parents are their first teachers. Sesame Street was very quick to teach us that parents must be allies and participants in excuse me, in their kids' education. Uh, we knew with Sesame Street that we could help and empower parents by helping them recognize teaching moments or age-appropriate behavior for their children. We need uh, to tell parents that it's not about buying a particular toy or a particular book. It's often about letting kids play with pots and pans in their kitchen and allowing kids to express themselves, not just repeat information that we've given them. I remember a teacher empowering my own mother when uh, the teacher said, your mother should, should tell you stories every night. So 
So I tell this to my mother, who's been working in a factory all day, then work, taking care of us at night. And she said, don't I got enough to do? And after she said that, she said, besides, we don't have any books. I went back to the teacher and I said, my mother can't tell me any stories. We don't have any books. And the teacher said, tell your mother that she can just make up stories. It doesn't matter what she tells you. Just, just make up stories. And that's what we did. Every night, my mother would tell me wonderful stories of her childhood when she was in Puerto Rico, and it enriched my life, and it gave me a love of books and certainly storytelling. My mother also taught me to maneuver. Si no te sale por una manera, que te salga por la otra. If it doesn't work out one way, go find another way. And that's what I used when I got into college, because I didn't have the grades and I didn't have the support from the teachers. So I, I maneuvered. This is a lesson that's sorely needed today that we have become, now that we have become a data-driven society, where there only seems to be one right answer, and we insist upon cramming information down kids' throat before they even experience the joys of thinking for themselves. We want to test them. Thank you. We want to test them and analyze them, giving them the false idea that it's all about memorizing facts. When they get to schools, we say we want them to think outside the box, yet we penalize them when they don't come up with the right answers that we provide. On Sesame Street, we did not only teach cognitive skills, there were social messages we wanted to get across. I'll never forget getting to the studio and seeing Lena Horne with all of her gravitas and all of her beauty singing It's Not Easy Being Green with Kermit the Frog. I remember thinking, is this song what I think it's about? Well, you bet it was. It was about race and self-acceptance. Self uh, but it allowed the viewer to come to his or her own conclusions depending on where the viewer was at. Um, as I said, I felt invisible as a child because when I was growing up, Latinos were not reflected in the media at all. And I wondered how I could contribute to a society that didn't see me. Well, after I've left the show, I've received many compliments. And one that stays in my mind is, you were the first Latina I ever saw. Now, I find that a remarkable statement because I believe that there were Latin people all around this Caucasian person who gave me that compliment. But I think I was the first Latina they really saw as a human being. And that's why they think I was the first one that they saw. Now, I wonder if people of color are becoming a risk of being invisible in the eyes of this current administration. I'm very concerned with this voucher system the Secretary of Education is proposing to have parents pick and create charter schools for their children. Are they aware that there are parents raising kids in homeless shelters? That there are parents holding down three jobs? that they might not have the luxury to sit around and wonder what different school or what teaching styles their kids uh, might uh, 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 try out for. Will the parents of all these affected, opioid-affected babies be able to help their kids with the school system? I was very distressed by watching this on PBS. All of these kids in Virginia that are, that have uh, are born with uh, opioid addiction. Nobody knows what conditions these kids are going to be in in five years, and they happen to live in uh, areas where they might not get medical care for children because they're poor in the current state of of, uh, of uh, the medical care system in America. John, John King Jr., the ex-Secretary of Education, tells this wonderful story that illustrates the importance of public school and teachers. His father was a widower who got early onset Alzheimer's before anybody knew what Alzheimer's was. And, and uh, uh, John King Jr. said that his father would wake them up at 2 o'clock in the morning and get them ready for school. And he said if it wasn't for the uh, predictability of public school, he would not have 
been able to have managed. I hope I'm not painted a doomed, uh, uh, I have not painted a picture of doom and gloom for you all. Uh, uh, don't worry, you will achieve your goals because you have very something very powerful on your sides, and that is the children that you will come in contact with. They are 24-7 information-seeking sponges. They want to know about the world. They want to know about their bodies. That's why we would have these silly songs on Sesame Street. I've got two eyes, one, two. They're both the same size, one, two. I got two eyes and they're both the same size. Kids love that. We have to get out of their way and put disciplining them, which is all too often the answer that we reach for, thinking that we're preparing them, uh, put disciplining them on the back seat. Babies want to interact, they want to play, they want to explore. That's why they can dig a hole in the sand and try to fill it with water eternally. They are born curious and confident. When you look at a bunch of kids and you say, hey, you, who can sing and dance? Don't they all raise their hands? You say, hey, the cute one, turn around. They all turn around. We have to help them become part of society by empowering them as early as possible. When a kid waves and the mother says, aren't you the smartest little boy for waving that way? It is giving him a message that he or she is important, that he or she matters. When we let a kid press the numbers on the elevator, it also empowers them. It tells them, you are manipulating your world. When we let them find their own seat on the bus, we are letting them know, wow, you really make some good decisions. They're born with their own sensibility. My own daughter did not want to be on Sesame Street. She didn't like being told what to do. She wouldn't do anything twice. She said to me, why do I have to make, your, I, make believe you're my mother when you really are my mother? <laughs> I had to respect the way she was and take her off the show. Finally, I'll say this. My mother remembers raising us in those early years as terrible. Yet I remember those early years as being wondrous. I remember when I discovered I had five fingers and five toes. I do. I remember specifically finding shapes in the cracks in the ceiling of our bedroom. And I remember the exact moment I learned how to read. I was on the train with my sister, the Grouch, <laughs> and I looked at, over her head at the ads. And I asked her, Aurea, what does that say? And she said, why don't you try reading it? <laughs> well, I thought reading was something you did at school with Dick and Jane books. I didn't know you were supposed to read words everywhere, that they were all over the place. <laughs> well, I looked at the ads, and lo and behold, I read. And I trembled the rest of the way home, reading about how good smoking Chesterfield cigarettes was for <laughs> Anyway, I envy that you are going to be with these children at the very beginning of their exploring the world and helping create the world that they ultimately want to, to live in. Oh, I've got my cutoff uh, time from Janice here, but actually I was not going to stop until I was done. And now I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, aren't you nice? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have time for Q&A? Oh, OK, great. All right. We do have time for a, Q a few Q&A, so that's good. So if you have, there were a couple of mics. If you will raise your hand. We will come to you for a question. We've got one right here. Mine is a comment, Sonia. I just want to thank Sesame Street for the opportunity 
in my own early childhood education because I had an opportunity in my degree program many years ago to be given an assignment that required me to watch one hour, not that I didn't want to watch <laughs> Sesame Street, but the assignment was to watch Sesame Street and to identify each individual learning opportunity that was built in for children during that one hour show. And I tabulated almost 96 <laughs> opportunities. And I just want to thank you for rem reminding me today of that incident and how valuable that was for me as I began to work with young children other than my home. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Get up. We've got a huge curriculum with a lot of research people and everything is thought out, everything you see. Another question? I'm looking. Minister's Nobody back. wants to know how tall Big Bird is? Oh. <laughs> I wanted to know. He's eight feet, two inches tall. Well, I was wondering if Oscar was after your sister, like the character <laughs> came after your sister. The curmudgeon. <laughs> yeah. You have a question? Yes. I'm from Brazil, and I was 13. I was in Sesame Street for one day, and I interviewed Big Bird. Oh my goodness, that's funny. <laughs> and in in Brazil, in Sesame Street, Big Bird is a pain in the butt. He chews on the kids' heads and pokes them with his big beak. Um, but it, when I moved to this country, it was so comforting to turn on the TV and see Sesame Street in English. And oh my God, it was so great. <laughs> and it helped me, it helped me relate to the society here, to what happened in this country and how, and how, how children are raised. And now I've been a provider for 24 years. So thank you. Thank you. So, yes. Right here. Did you have to um, persuade uh, the station or your producers to also provide some Spanish language on Sesame Street, and if you did, or were they resistant? Were they resistant to becoming bilingual, and what did you do to get them to? That's a good question. It was, I, I didn't do it. They wanted to, the Latino kids to see me and Emilio Delgado and have someone to relate to. As, as I said, up until that time, Latinos were not in the media at all. And they had a lot of academics, and, and they wanted me to just be myself. I would say, what's Maria like? And they would say, just be real. We want kids to relate to you as a real person. So I would say, OK, great. So meanwhile, I'm going to New York, right? So I start talking with a lot of Spanglish that I don't know it's Spanglish. I thought it was real words. So I'm telling Big Bird, let's go lonchal. See you on El Rufo. And uh, uh, the, uh, which was lunch and roof. So, so meanwhile, my mother uses these words. So the academics, they have a big, big, you know, academic Latino people. They told the producers, that girl is not speaking Spanish. <laughs> so the producers came to me, they don't know. And they're saying, what's up? This academic says, you're not speaking Spanish. Of course I'm speaking Spanish. My mother uses those words. Little did I know that my mother also made up words. <laughs> so I went to Emilio Delgado and I said, Emilio, you don't know what lonchar is? He says, look, I got to tell you, we don't use lonchar or rufa. That's so New York Spanglish. It's not, uh, and of course, his Spanish is much more uh, uh, better, more sophisticated, at larger vocabulary. So it, it made us rethink that a little bit because I thought, well, even though my Spanglish is really New Yorican and I'm a real person and language changes, it evolves. With every generation, there's a whole new set of vocabularies. But we decided not to uh, use colloquialism and only use words that every Latino kid would understand. We didn't want Mexican American children to, you know, roll, you know, say, what is this girl Maria talking about? And it inspired some great little songs. We wrote a song that, that went, uh, 
You say naranja and I say china. You say naranja because Puerto Ricans say china and Mexican Americans say naranja. So uh, I, I think it was a great example of facing the problem. Don't hide it. Don't say, oh, I don't know what I'm speaking, you know. But face it, and then you'll come up with a good solution. She's in charge now. No time's up for us. <laughs> yeah. One more over here. I, OK, in the back. Very quickly, I just wanted to echo what was said before. Maria, I'm Maria. Sonia, I'm sure you know this. You'll always be Maria to me. But uh, you, you were not only the first Latina maybe many people saw on television here in the US, but to people of color growing up around the world, I grew up in Australia. You may still be one of the only people of color on TV. <laughs> um, and it was liberating. It was incredibly liberating. And for um, a, a country that, that may be quite monocultural, you also helped us learn um, in older grades, you were used as for us to understand other children from Latin America and that they spoke Spanish. And I know you're not Colombian. But you were very liberating for the Colombian girls that I went to school with and oh. for others. So, so I think your influence goes way above and beyond just this country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Again, you were very good. Good luck. Thank you. Wow. What a way to start the afternoon. <laughs> I, I'm just so hopeful. It, it just breathes hope into the work we do. So thank you so much, Sonia Manzano. Really. Ah. OK, at uh, this moment, I would like to invite up to the stage my good friend Moira Kenny, wherever she is. There she is, over there. Uh, for the, of those of you who might not know, Moira is the executive director of the First Five Association of California, the membership organization for First Fives across California. She is my good partner in working as, as we go forward in all that we do, and uh, one of the smartest people I know. Thank so, you. So there you go. Thank you. Moira. Thanks, everybody. Um, so if you're like me, you could just sort of do Sesame Street uh, recollections for the rest of the afternoon. I feel like compelled to say that I grew up in a low-income community in a town that didn't have preschool or kindergarten. So when I was four and a half, my mom, who took care of not just me, but a bunch of the kids in the neighborhood, she said, a really big thing is happening today. There's a new show on TV. And we're going to go next door because we didn't have one. And we sat down and watched the very first episode of Sesame Street. Um, so I feel like I could thank you, Sonia, all day long. Um, so I want to thank the Advancement Project for another great water cooler, uh, for conversations that matter, um, and more importantly, that bring us together. And I'm taking just a couple of minutes after Sonia's uh, amazing keynote to tell you about a new partnership we have, we all have here in California with Sesame Street. Um, as you all know, the election last November changed our work in so many ways. Issues we thought that had been resolved, like health care for all or security for dreamers, were suddenly up in the air. And as advocates at the association and across the state, our work turned from thinking about the possibility of new federal support uh, for early learning to protecting the narrow wins we'd already had in the last eight years. But for our families and our, for communities, as you know, the changes have been so much more dramatic. So sitting at the association's office, we started to hear from First Fives across the state about the calls that they were getting from partner agencies, family resource centers, preschools, and other community partners. You, you don't need to know the statistics from me. Nearly half of California's children have immigrant parents, and nearly a quarter of those are undocumented, and they are served by First Five and all of you. And they were living, quite simply, in a state of fear. Among the stories we were hearing were that preschool centers Parents didn't want to leave their kids there in the morning, or they were requesting alternate arrangements to drop them off or pick them up from care for fear of being apprehended. Home visitors were getting texts from clients saying they could no longer participate in home visits for fear that their data might be turned in to ICE. Children at preschool were playing differently, building walls to keep other children out, and children were asking parents to make them a copy of papers that would say they could stay in the country. So across the state, our commission started responding, adjusting their meetings with contractors and grantees to talk about the ways that our programs can support immigrant children and families. 
sharing new resources from immigrant rights groups that we hadn't worked with before to plan for unimaginable scenarios. And even, truthfully, because we are funders, adjusting our fiscal policies when we realized that some programs, like home visiting, simply weren't going to meet their utilization targets. So knowing that we all needed new resources to support our families and our partners, we reached out to Sesame Street, an organization we'd worked with in the past, and an organization who, who as we all know, really knows how to communicate with children about really big issues in ways that both educate and reassure. So we asked them, I asked them, well, could you help us? We need some materials here in California that we can share with young children at this particular moment in their lives, since most advocacy organizations are focused on materials for parents. And they were excited and honored to partner with all of us here in California. And I say all of us, not just First Five, since, many of, since they were, like many of us, trying to figure out how to be relevant. So Sesame worked with us and a number of local California partners to determine focus and create content for what would be their first piece focusing on the needs of immigration folks. So what emerged was this resource, Care, Cope, and Connect, which I hope you all got a copy of, um, yeah, out there. And, and we have now distributed more than 100,000 copies of Care, Cope, and Connect across the state. But I wanted to say, because California's children are very vulnerable in so many ways, this is just the beginning. So on Friday, Sesame Street will be releasing re-releasing Care, Cope, and Connect, which is available in English, Spanish, Korean, and Arabic, by uh, unveiling a full suite of materials focused on trauma, ACEs, and supporting families um, more deeply uh, to reassure families uh, with both social media, a new website, uh, press, and all of this we released on Friday. The resources will include new bilingual content, including videos, storybooks, digital activities, all featuring our favorite friends, the Muppets. Um, and we would love to work with all of you in the weeks ahead to share these materials uh, with your families, with your partners, and really honestly with folks here in Sacramento so that they understand the importance of thinking about trauma and supporting families um, from the very first day. So we know that we must continue and increase our advocacy on behalf of families across California. And I believe that this work with Sesame is a way to link our advocacy efforts with our daily work with families, work that fuels and feeds our collective work on behalf of California's kids. Thanks. Wow. Thanks, Moira. What a great resource, and it's so good to hear that it's already making its way out into all of our communities. So building off of Sonia Manzano's keynote and Moira Kenny's presentation uh, about how we can help support our immigrant children and families in this critical time, our work with dual language learners and their families is even more important, and that's hard to imagine, than ever. And our upcoming panel, we're very excited to say, is we'll be discussing providing uh, providing early childhood education to our dual language learners. At First Five California, we are very excited that our commission has highlighted actually the importance of uh, children knowing and understanding and what an asset it can be for them to know uh, and speak two languages. And in doing this, they are investing, uh, we, they, the commission approved and we are investing in a research study to identify strategies and programs that provide quality for dual language learners and create rich learning environments for young learners. You'll learn more about the, the pilot and the research study uh, in the panel, but we are so excited that our commission has taken this strong stand and really is committed to doing this work. Um, because we should be encouraging children to learn English as well as speaking their home language and creating and, and celebrating their culture and bringing that all together in our classrooms. So we are very excited about that. We are taking the first steps uh, towards the implementing the pilot. Uh, and uh, as I said, you'll hear more about that. But when I'm fortunate enough to go into classrooms across the state, and watch these young children grow and thrive in a multitude of languages, in a multitude of cultures come together and celebrate one another. 
it is just amazing. And it does, it's inspiring and does give hope for the future and for the citizens that are going to, to uh, take care of all of us one day, for some of us sooner than others. No, just whatever. So uh, we are very excited about this panel, and it looks like we've got chairs almost set up, uh, which, uh, so I am pleased uh, to welcome Vicki Ramos, uh, Vicki Ramos Harris, back up to the stage. She is gonna facilitate this panel, and she is right there. Okay, please welcome the panel up on stage. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> We're in the home stretch here. It's been a great day. It's been a great day. Uh, I am excited to bring on this panel, Focus on Dual Language Learners. Again, Vicki Ramos Harris with Advancement Project California. Uh, before I uh, introduce our distinguished guest, I want to do a quick um, well, and first I wanted to say thank you to Camille and the team at First Five California for helping to elevate the importance of dual language learners and policy in our discussions. The, the, the pilot is critically important, um, and so we just want to thank, thank your team. Um, so I want to do a quick uh, context setting, and I want to make sure I'm doing this right. Um, so is this... PowerPoint on? Yeah, the PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there we go. So those are our, our speakers. Um, and we will talk about quality ECE for dual language learners. So context setting. Oh, wrong direction? <laughs> ah. There we go, sorry. Okay, so before we get started, terminology, right? So dual language learners is the term we use in early childhood. All kids are learning language when they are born, right? So when those kids who are learning more than one language are our dual language learners. Uh, in in K-12, we talk about them as English learners and that they're showing that they don't have yet the English level, proficiency level, of their peers, and so they're working to build their English. It is also a term that really only focuses on English, right? As opposed to dual language learners, it, it, it thinks about the term, the, the, in an assets perspective uh, of learning multiple languages. So the entire group together is our DLL slash ELs, and that's our, and then people sometimes say, well, what about dual language programs versus dual language learners, dual immersion? So dual language programs are programs, Dual language learners are children, English learners are children. So in California, we have nearly a quarter of the pop, uh, US population's English learners. In California, our, uh, our elementary schools, 70% of our 1.4 million um, English learners are in our elementary schools, and we have over 33% of those are just focused in our, in our kindergarten. And when we look at zero to five population, we have almost 60% of our zero to five population that are dual language learners. So California, as I said before, has a very important leadership role to play for the education of English learners and dual language learners in, in our country. Our, our dual language learners and English language learners, they are across our state, right? So we all, uh, whether or not you were officially trained, they are in your classrooms. They are in our classrooms. They are in our communities. Um, and so we know that our dual language learners represent every major ethnic and racial group. Uh, that includes both US born and foreign born. Um, and uh, most of our dual language learners come from Latin America and Asia, most of which come from Mexico. We know from the neuroscience that the critical period for learning language is in those earliest years, right? And that has been verified by research, which I don't, I don't have enough time to get into, but, 
But the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine uh, released a report this year that verifies what we know about the importance of home language and how that serves as a foundation for English proficiency and for academic achievement. And we, we know all the great things about bilingualism and the benefits of that. So here in California, we've had some uh, exciting policy changes. One, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about Proposition 58 and the opportunity to build more bilingual opportunities for all students. And as you heard Sarah Neville Morgan mention earlier this morning, the adoption of the California English Learner Roadmap, uh, which, which is aligned with the research and aligned with the state's priorities and includes bilingual, bilingualism and biliteracy as a goal, and it also includes early childhood. So that's a really important um, uh, foundation, right, for our policies moving forward, our forward-thinking policies, that it starts at early childhood. So this little quote is actually the vision statement from the, from the policy. Uh, English learners fully and meaningfully access participation in the 21st century education from early childhood through grade level. I underlined that. Uh, the results in attaining high levels of English proficiency, mastery, uh, grade level standards and opportunities to develop proficiency in multiple language. That is a vision for our state. And so that's really exciting. So before we um, move on uh, and start with our panel, I do want to play a, a quick clip of the SEAL program. Um, the SEAL model was, not a program, it's a model. The SEAL model was um, recognized by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And, and so this panel, uh, our goal is to really uplift best and promising practices and the direction that we want to head. So this is a quick video on how we are, uh, what that looks like. SEAL stands for the Sobrato Early Academic Language Model. It was really designed to demonstrate, to show people what it can look like when schooling is designed to be rigorous, high level, joyful, and with English learners at the center. Okay. Go put your heads together. It's the joy of learning, the joy of inquiry, the joy of exploration, and that comes because they're engaged in deep thinking and deep learning. It can be done in any school with any set of teachers. Healthy soil sucks up the water. Okay. It's a very real model of what can be done with real teachers in real communities when you have the understanding of the needs of English learners and the will to do it right. Excellent job, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, I first want to say that we will be collecting cards on 3x5, so please submit throughout the conversation and, and we'll integrate them in our conversation. Um, so I'd like to begin, uh, I fi finally, introducing our distinguished panel. Uh, here we have Chandasi Patel, who is our uh, program officer at Heising Simons Foundation, who has been leading the work on dual language learners, um, and she's going to be talking about her work uh, from the foundation's perspective. We have Lupe Jaime, is a commissioner at First Five California, and also serves as the director of early care and education at Fresno uh, County Superintendent of Schools. And she's going to be sharing about her work uh, with the commission, but also in her work on dual language learners, and particularly in the work in QRIS. Uh, Carol, Dr. Carola Oliva Olsen is the associate professor at. Uh, Cal State University Channel Islands. She has been leading work at the university to bring dual language learners as the central piece of their teaching preparation program in early childhood education. And Dr. Marlene Cepeda is a professor emeritus at the Development of Child and Family Studies at Cal State Los Angeles and has been leading work to bring together the research and policy and help us think about the path forward for systemic change. So with that, thank you for the extended introduction. And uh, we'll start off with Ms. Chandasi. Oh, hi. Thank you, Vicki. Um, nice to be here with all of you. Um, the Heising Simons Foundation invests in early education across a number of different areas. But one of the first questions we asked ourselves back in 2013 as we were ramping up our grant making was, um, 
who the young child population in California is. And when we look at the statistics, 60% of kids under the age of five speak a language other than English at home. And we started thinking about the, the idea of what high quality education for young children looks like. And we quickly came to the conclusion that um, in the absence of um, an active dialogue about what language and culture, uh, how language and culture affects how a child experiences life and learning, we were never going to get at um, the quality that we wanted for, for young children and, and for the early childhood education system. And so back in 2013, we started investing in um, demographic analysis to really show who young children in um, California are, what their family um, home life is like from a language and culture perspective. We began investing in research like the National Academy study that um, Vicky mentioned that to really sort of corral, what the, corral the evidence based around what um, quality instruction for dual language learners looks like and also to identify the gaps in what we know about what high quality um, instruction looks like. And we began to engage in a policy dialogue um, and policy advocacy um, development that you'll hear about later to really begin to to ask the question of uh, how best to, um, again, corral uh, will, resources, and capacity to, to engage the early childhood field in meeting the needs of young children in California, again, 60% of whom um, are um, children of immigrants or um, language learners. Um, and this was in 2013, we started doing this grant making, and it is incredible to see in four years, um, you know, how much has happened in the state. Um, First Five's DLL pilot is path-breaking local control funding formula for K-12 and pre-K-12 um, students has opened up funding for children of immigrants. Uh, the EL roadmap, it's, it's just incredible to be sitting here four years um, from 2013 and have DLLs be such a central component of um, the early childhood discussion here. So it's just very humbling and we're really excited to continue this work um, and uh, you know, move beyond what I think we've been hearing for a while is we don't know what high quality instruction looks like for DLLs. I think we're starting to get a sense of what that looks like and um, we're just looking forward to advancing this dialogue on behalf of young children. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to um, wear two hats and of course because of time then a disclosure that I'm giving you guys cliff note versions of both the, the stories I'm going to share. One is on California First Five Commission. So I just want to take a moment and celebrate together because I don't think we celebrate enough the investment of five years for 20 million dollars. Mm -hmm. I think that really you know <laughs> needs an applause. I think that's a shout out to where our investments should be and a value system for our state. Um, so with that then, there's two components of that. And again, Cliff Moton version of that. One is um, evaluation. Um, that is one of the components of that. And it's gonna focus on whether it's scalable, effective, and high quality services and these pilots that we're gonna be looking at. The pilots itself will be looking at early learning settings, partnership with engaging with families, and supporting educators' professional development. And again, I am condensing a whole lot into you know, my short version of what the DLL par, um, pilot is. But as a commissioner also, we had a sense of urgency that we could not wait till the five years was um, completed to start doing this work. So we started to look at our Talk, Read, Sing initiative and decided that that was a good place to start talking about how important these gifted, and I will say gifted children are, because they're capable of having more than one language and how we need to support um, this effort. So my other hat as a director of early care and education, Fresno County Office of Ed or Superintendent of Schools, that's a long, I think I took one minute to say that, sorry. <laughs> um, we are doing some boots on the ground work. One is um, our county also decided to look at our QRS matrix and our Fresno local consortium had adopted on our QRS matrix to make our five um, tier uh, where we can add some local elements to reflect um, PD around uh, dual language learners. So that means that the workforce would have to complete X amount of hours, 21 hours yearly, 
to be able to uh, meet the needs of dual language learners. And so that was, again, a very bold statement that we did. The second thing that we're doing in Fresno County is also around the Starting Smart and Strong Packard Grant. That's a 10-year investment where they gave us some support to have some innovative strategies on reporting on supporting dual language learners. Uh, we created a PLC, professional learning community, composed of all the segments. We're gonna scale up to eventually exempt family, um, friends, and neighbors. But at this point, phase one was TK. It included preschool teachers. It included private family licensed, um, la licensed family child care home providers. Uh, let me make sure. That all service children from zero through five years old to be able to support then a group PLC together where they're learning together and talking about what strategies to report to support this workforce. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to be talking about um, the EC workforce and when what the story is when they come into um, a higher ed institution. I'm um, a professor in the School of Education uh, at CSU Channel Islands. And under the School of Education, we have the Early Childhood Studies program for undergraduate students. And it starts with who our students are. So they themselves, the majority, are first generation students going to college. And um, English is their second language. So there's a lot of differences in, ser in serving this population because many of them work during the day, so they don't have the opportunity to experience the university life and have a hard time navigating the system. So supporting them from the beginning, but also addressing some of the issues that have to do with affordability, English language skills, math. Um, we have, as a Hispanic serving institution, different grants and other initiatives, for example, with First Five uh, Ventura, on how to support the colleges, the students going through the transferring from the college into the university. So it starts there. Another part of it has to do with uh, the seal of biliteracy, for example, looking into ways in which we can bring that at the university level and celebrate and focus on their, uh, the strengths of their language skills. Um, but then in looking at the program itself, we have built the um, coursework to include in all of the learning outcomes dual language learning. So what does it mean to support children who are dual language learners when you take a course in family engagement? There are several in family engagement, community engagement, um, courses on, from infant, toddlers, um, student teaching, language as a social culture, uh, as a social context, but then a standalone course also that focuses on, child, on children who are dual language learners. And how do we support them um, in a program that starts, goes all the way from birth through age eight. So teachers really look at the developmental continuum of learning, but have to focus on who these children are, who we serve in our community, and the majority are children who are dual language learners. So you might have, you might go into a private school or um, another area and just have one child who's a dual language learner, or all. It might be one language, or it might be five different languages, and then what do you do? So um, one of the courses right now that I'm teaching um, focuses on the, the students themselves getting very well prepared to understand and recognize the stages of language acquisition, and then be able to scaffold and provide enhancements and strategies to support the children in the stages of language development that they are. So being able to follow every child, but then also be able um, to do that in, a, in the context of many children in many different stages um, simultaneously. Okay. My time's up. Your time's up. <laughs> well, we're supposed to be watching for the time. Yes, I just yep. saw something oh, flying okay. there. <laughs> I can't, the lights are blinding. I was asked to bring in the rear um, in terms of the commentary um, I know many of you in the audience uh, know that I have been working on this topic for close to 40 years, focusing particularly on Spanish-speaking uh, immigrant populations, but I have expanded. 
And what I'd like to do is just underscore some of the themes that you have heard actually throughout the conference and, and how that then applies to DLLs. Because what Vicki asked me to do was to identify the visions and goals of how DLLs can be integrated into the, the overall ECE landscape, so to speak. And one of the first things that we have to recognize as a field, and in the state of California, it took us a while to recognize this, that these children, these DLL children, really are our children. They represent the majority of children, zero to five, in the state of California. I, I, don't, I could talk a long time about how long it took us to kind of get there, um, but it, 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 this recognition of who our children are and what they need. This other recognition of moving from a deficit perspective to a strength-based perspective. If you read the National Academy report, it is very clear in that report. And one of the things that we have to really think about, and this I get from my colleague Lori Olson, is how we interpret the achievement gap between DLLs and monolingual English speakers. Because part of the issue when we're looking at the gap, so to speak, is we're looking at English-only outcomes. And a, a young dual language learner, a, a young child learning a second language takes anywhere from four to seven years to become proficient and fluent in that language. So when I was working for the State Department on the preschool foundations, you know, the attitude was, we'll put them into pre-K for nine months, half, half, half day programs, and they were gonna come out at the other end being on par with monolingual English speakers. Well, ha, 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 that's not gonna happen. So we need to really be very, very, we really gotta drill down on this issue and be realistic about our expectations and that this is a long-term uh, commitment that we need to make for our DLL children. We also need to understand within the broader early childhood framework, what is universal, universally good for all children and what is culturally specific and linguistically appropriate for different populations. I, we talk about it, we give it lip service, you know, how many times do we read in, in books? We gotta honor the language and culture and I would always say, what the hell does that mean? Um, we need to begin to drill down on that issue, and that's where the QRS discussion comes into it. And then I think finally we have to, and this is, comes out very loud and clear in the National Academy report, we have to be clear that we need to support the home language. When we support the home language, and there's different ways of doing that from a pedagogical standpoint, we are not only enhancing the cognitive skills of that child by developing their concept development, because it's really about concept development, but we're also profoundly affecting their socio-emotional relationships with their language and culture. And so we need to recognize that. And I think we've talked around the margins about this for a long time. And, and, and we are now in a very good place in the state of California to begin to potentiate some of these ideas. And one of the ways that, that I, uh, one of the things that I'm involved with under the sponsorship of Heising Simon is a, uh, an advocacy framework for uh, young DLLs, which should come out, we're hoping, when? In the fall. In the fall. <laughs> we're we're the on the fall. <laughs> I've been working on this all year. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about this. We're, we will have a launch soon, and we were and we were in um, we were in communication with the EL roadmap that's coming out of the State Department. So we're we're not working at cross purposes, um, but it really is a advocacy. It's a coordinated action, call to action to integrate preschool within the early primary grades. Now, there's been a lot of discussion in this conference about and next time we're gonna have a birth to 12 water cooler, the whole issue of the, the K through 12, the TK through 12 system, beginning to embrace and think about four-year-olds. Now, I don't wanna call TK preschool, but I have been known to do that. Um, and this is one way to slice the pie. We do have a pre-K three movement throughout the United States. 
it, there's a lot of success in certain places, particularly in the, in, in the state of Washington. So what we have done with this advocacy uh, document is that we have identified four general buckets with a fifth silent bucket. So let me just briefly outline what those are. Uh, one of them has to do with workforce capacity. We want to make sure that it's not just the teachers and the people that are working on the ground with the children, it's the administrators mm -hmm. that need to know about young, they need to know about early childhood and they need to know about dual language learners. We need to really start to think more about the pedagogical practices that we're using and that's why the SEAL program has gotten so much um, uh, so popular because it's one of the only ones that we have. Um, assessment, oh, whole, that's a whole mm -hmm. big other issue. We need to have fair and equitable assessment for dual language learners. If they are not assessed in their home language, mm -hmm. we are undercutting what, what we know about what they know. And so it's not, it's not an equitable assessment. It's not a fair assessment. So we need more accurate and, uh, and linguistically appropriate measures. And then the last bucket we have in this roadmap is systems uh, alignment. The whole notion of how does the ECE, or the zero to five more aptly put, uh, community talk with a TK through 12 community. We need to begin to build those bridges. I know it's an anathema to some people, and, but this is where we're moving systemically. And so there needs, and first five, I'm a first five commissioner, you're a first five commissioner, I've, I've been bringing it up with the first five commissions because <laughs> the first five commissions stop at age five. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, yeah, but four year olds are in K through 12. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, the last piece, which has also been talked about in this conference that we've tried to integrate, which is very, very important for dual language learners, is family engagement. We know that parents who participate in the educational uh, enterprise of their children and the activities of their children, that that's a positive thing. And it, 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 it shows better academic payoff later on down the road. But for immigrant families who are not familiar with the educational system, it is the responsibility of the system to reach out to them to bring them in and let them know how they can participate. And with local control funding, um, there is that parent component, and that's very important. So I think I'm out of time, right? So I'll stop there because I can talk a lot. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, one of the questions, well, so I, I appreciate each kind of lens that each of our panelists brings. One of the questions that we've been talking about a lot is how do we define quality early care and education, right? And how do, do we find it, how do we define it in a more expansive way? And we know that uh, quality is often defined, I, I, we often lead in, in the QRAS conversation. So that we know that, that we're, that's still in development. But Lupe, you have been doing some work in Fresno that you started to talk about. But could you talk a little bit more about, you know, you all have indicators on your QRAS. And so, that is not an easy thing to do. There are conversations you all have had and there are steps that you have taken uh, to get to this place that it's, you can see it reflected in your indicators. And I know there are other communities that have been focused on in their larger QRS conversation and quality conversation, they have been focused or had a focus on DLLs, but it hasn't yet necessarily translated to what we see in indicators. So it would be really great to hear about what you all have been doing, you know, the conversations you've had and, and what's that meant for you all. So it's um, so we just started implementing. So I don't want to <laughs> get ahead of myself, but I do want to celebrate just to have that launch because I think that's important. Uh, when you're looking at those tiers, and we have our common tiers, and you have the flexibility to be able to put in as a consortia um, what you feel are, I guess, a reflection of your values, and mm -hmm. be able in this case to be able to call out dual language learners as a very important sector of your system, which we did. I think that says a lot. So in our case, then, uh, what happens is in order for a uh, a site, whether it's a licensed family childcare home or a uh, center base, for them to reach the five stars, and ours is f stars, they have to meet 
everything in the matrix plus our local uh, requirement. In this case, it's the 21 hours of professional growth on dual language learners. Uh, what's unique about that is that we actually have an implementation guide that will discuss what does that look like. Uh, is it just taking a course from this individual or is it a little more strategic of having a vetted individual or place to take these hours from so you know that it is meaningful strategies aligning with what we're talking about. There's another local requirement that we have in regards to, in regards to culturally and linguistically practices, seeing that. And we have a local implementation guide that talks about when an evaluator goes out to a site, what does that look like? Parent engagement would be called out specifically. Is there evidence of that? What's interesting is that we give a list of things, ingredients per se, that you can call it out, but because the QRS caters to um, to different facilities, you want to make sure that it's not prescribed. That's the cautious thing, that an evaluator does not use a checklist and say these are individual, these are things that have to be there in order to meet this. And therefore, um, that is, I think, the key thing of where we are this year is to make sure that what we're looking at are key ingredients and are going to show value and not be, be another thing that we can document on this matrix. Thank you. So what is it going to take uh, to move the needle forward on, on DLLs? And th th we've made some progress. What, what do you think are important? Uh, and this is for everybody. Uh, what, what sort of a foundational, so there's like lots of things that you can do, but then there's some of those things are, if you take these first few steps, that goes a really long way. So from each of your perspectives, can you talk about what you think uh, would be you know, step one or, or where you think it's important to focus some energy. And you can well, popcorn, I think uh, but, but we'd like to hear from everybody. Something that has happened, the way it's been in the past is that teachers just go to a training offered somewhere and then they come back and they want to implement some ideas and it doesn't work. It doesn't work because if the leadership, if the administrators are not on board and understand what that means and how that inf packs the whole program, then it doesn't go, which makes the teachers not feel very good, and it keeps on going that, that way. So something that I feel has to happen is that the leadership administrators have to be involved, that it has to not be just a one-time shot training, it has to be ongoing, and it has to be based on situated context meaning there is a reality in that classroom at that point in time. So the languages that are spoken by the children, the, who the families are, who the teachers are, the resources that are available. And that allows for a certain approach to be able to be implemented. Mm -hmm. And then decisions can be made. And then the trainings respond to that context. Otherwise, we're just getting some universal strategies that might, you know, that you can teach anywhere and just take that course and make it go. Right. That's not the case. Well, I think, I think Carola's talking about a bottom-up approach, mm -hmm. but you could also have a top-down approach. I know we don't like to talk about top-down, but um, from a policy, an advocacy perspective, you have local control funding formula where parents can have input where preschool could be part of it, and some districts have used L uh, LCFF's funding for preschool. Mm -hmm. um, we just finished a long battle, battle fight, with, uh, e on ESSA in the state of California, the ESSA plan, to try to embed preschool, make it more visible, early learning within the ESSA plan for the state of California. The actual legislation of ESSA mentions early learning in preschool over 50 times, 5-0. And other states actually call it a pre-K-12 plan. So many of the advocates in this room, we really did fight and, and try to get that message out um, because we know that if that guidance, we have a lot of policy guidance actually in the state of California for DLLs, but unless there's some teeth associated with that, unless there's money that, that is associated with that, it, you know, it's hard to motivate uh, school systems. 
And then I think Proposition 58 also is an important uh, step forward in, for all DLLs and ELLs in the state of California. This was a huge, a huge win for the children in the state of California. And it's not just for immigrant children. One of the things about Proposition 58 and one of the things that is moving the DLL agenda in our nation are middle class parents who want their children to be bilingual. They're the ones that stand in line at Glendale Unified School District all night because they want their child to be in that particular bilingual class because they recognize the, the economic and the cognitive and, emo and they recognize all the benefits that are associated with being bilingual. So it's not just about immigrant children, it's about all the, all the children of California. And the master plan for the state of California does say, if anybody wants to look it up, that we are a multicultural state and we, we should value our multiculturalism and our multilingualism. So I think that there are policy pieces that are, that are percolating within the state that we can capitalize on to try to move the, to move the agenda. Mm -hmm. And I can speak to, as a county level, I think Fresno County had a level what we call readiness. And the reason for that is because for a while now, our university had recognized with a few pioneers that we needed to make sure we prepared our workforce. We were all kind of sending the same message, but from our different lenses. And so what occurred was that um, there was a group of us that got together just over, you know, pan dulce and cafecito, <laughs> you know, one day and complaining about all the problems in the world. And this was one of the ones that bubbled up. And I just remember sitting at that table and saying, well, let's just do something about it. And so a group of us then continued to meet and we formed what we called the um, consortium. So it focused, it was very strategic the way we thought of doing it. Even though it was part of Fresno State, um, it had representation of early care and education, which I was the co-chair. And then my co-chair colleague was from higher ed. And we did that very strategically to represent the pipeline, to say it's not their children, it's not that section, it's not Our that children. section, it's all of us. And of this group of representation of superintendents, it was representation of teachers, it was representation of licensed family child care homes, representation of you know um, businesses. So it was very diverse. It had your usual suspects, unusual suspects all coming to the <coughs> table and speaking you know, with a common lens and a common you know, goal. From that, we were able to push the university to do a couple things. One, to offer what we call a multilingual, multicultural master's degree at Fresno State. The second thing was to do the BAP, which is the bilingual authorization um, to support our um, workforce with, with that piece too. But then we wanted to make sure that that trickled down to our early care and education because we do have a master's in ECE also. And so it wasn't, like, again, in silos. This group has this piece and this group has this piece. And we brought in our community college too because that is a lot of times where our workforce um, you know, gets started too a lot of times when they enter in for those core classes. So I think there is also that level of readiness that you have to be able to collaborate amongst your colleagues to pull this together and then start pushing policies too. You know, I, if I could just add, so mm -hmm. Carola talked about, what she talked about was the need for skills and tools for educators to actually work with children and families on the ground. Marlene talked about further policy development so that um, sort of the, the, the spirit of the policy language um, in our state gets really enacted. And Lupe, you just talked about will and, and, and sort of I think the connecting ingredient in all this unfortunately is resources. We are an under-resourced um, field in general. Yes. Um, and you know, eventually maybe you know, we're coming to a new dawn with a, with a new governor where there might be more resources available to the field. Um, eventually if we can get to a point where those conversations around resource allocation take into consideration language and culture, um, that sort of, that'll be the real tipping point. The work, I feel like we're getting close and it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One of the questions here uh, was kind of building on this in terms of, we've, we spent the last 10 years talking about closing the achievement gap. Now that dual language learning uh, is being accepted, will future generations be exposed to high quality instruction in both languages that results in surpassing this gap? 
um, and being at an advantage as a bilingual and a biliterate student. And so that's, you know, for our dual language learners, we also know the research shows that um, bilingualism is good for everybody and, right. and that uh, all, all of us are capable of learning multiple languages. And that California had the first seal of biliteracy that has spread to how many states now? Yeah, 27. 27 states have adopted the right. seal of biliteracy. Um, it's being considered at the federal level by um, Julia Brownlee. Brownlee has put it forward. So in light of what else is going on nationally, it, this is a yeah. movement. And yeah. we're piloting it in some um, colleges and universities at that level. And that brings an, another point that for EC workforce, um, especially those who um, s uh, English is their second language, that most of the time they don't feel confident when they come to college. They don't have a voice. And to help them uh, by taking courses that have to do with policy, to learn about all the things that are happening and how they affect them, but also how to develop a voice and be able to advocate for what they, we all need and what children and families need, but what they need as teachers. And um, so we just piloted one uh, a policy and advocacy course, and one of the things that we took from Eli, from English Language Legacy Initiative that is happening in California, is this idea of having an echo and how you're not alone as a teacher in, and you need to find someone who you can be their echo and then find someone to echo what you believe in, whether it's at your school, at your church, um, with other families, and get the point across. Mm -hmm. Building on, you mentioned right now, students in your universities who have English as a second language. So someone asked a question about what are the challenges that uh, ESL students uh, face having uh, in terms of obtaining their general units and what strategies are you implementing to ensure they're gaining transferable units to four-year colleges and universities? Can, can you or speak to, uh, so essentially for students who English is their second language, once they end up in our higher ed system, you know, sometimes there can be challenges getting uh, the general units um, and then uh, getting over to four-year college. Yes. Um, that's our challenge, and that's a big one. We still haven't, um, we've worked with a cohort. We have a project right now with Oxnard College. Uh, this is through Ventura First Five. Um, and trying to follow the students and see how we can build up, you know, the support. We did a, a math uh, pilot for um, um, those, there's a math specific class that teachers can't pass and, um, we worked one-on-one. -on -one. We helped the math department choose appropriate textbooks um, and provide support. There's also a course that provides um, uh, tutors and coaches along the way. Um, and helping them navigate. Right now, it's all one-on-one -on -one and building a, a strong relationship with each student and help them individually. Um, we hope that some part, in the, many of those classes, we allow them to read and write things in Spanish um, when it's content-based. Um, but it's, it's a challenge that we face in the state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to respond because I think I can easily be um, vulnerable and share that I'm the poster shelf for that. Um, so English is not my first language. Uh, I struggle with it quite often. Um, it is a very difficult language to learn and coming from the migrant uh, background where we did a few months here and a few months there, I was not able to have a strong foundation of education either in here or in Mexico because I was between the two worlds for the very longest time. And when I reflect back at what got me through um, schooling, and addressing the, the English, um, it really came down to the relationship. There was individuals in my life who did not give up on me, who continued to say yes, but, you know, and referred me back to um, 
a worn handover. And I think that our, our practices can be that for so many individuals. When you're working with, don't forget our infants and toddlers, and our licensed family child care homes, and even our licensed exempt family, friends, and neighbors who want to do this work. And I truly believe that they want to do it well, um, that we are there for them, and we make sure we have a system that they can be reflected in this system, and they can you know, see just as valuable as anyone else. Um, because our youngest learners are in these settings. And I believe that that key relationship that we hold or we create will be the key of their success. Thank you. Um, so one of, we saw the, the, the clip from SEAL that gives us a little bit of more detail on what we need to see in the classroom. Um, we, you all talked generally about it, but usually there's a question about, so what does it look like? Can we talk about best practices a little bit more specifically so people understand tangibly what does that mean? Um, so, so that's sort of part one. And then the second part of that question is also about the um, best practices for DLLs whose home language is not Spanish, mm -hmm. right? So, and when there's, Carola, as you talked about, when there's multiple languages. <coughs> so can you help us? understand a little bit more about what that looks like. Well, the first part is what kind of approach are we talking about? Is it what kind of model is it being, uh, is being implemented in that particular, say, a classroom? And what kinds of languages are there? But if we're talking about a dual, uh, say, a balanced bilingual program, as using the terminology from CD, um, then you would have a specific kind of strategies used when you have the uh, same kind of number of minutes, say, or days for one language as the other one, whether it be Vietnamese and English or Spanish and English. And then the kinds of um, activities, experiences that happen will be available and provided in both languages. If you have many other languages and the teachers only, is, there's not a match between the teacher's language and the children's language, then the best approach might be English with home language support. There's always, regardless of the, uh, the model, there's always going to be systematic home language support. And those are particular strategies that um, start with knowing the families and knowing the background um, of those children and the languages they speak and what other um, supports they have. Um, knowing, uh, focusing on storybook reading and vocabulary, uh, comprehension, but getting children to speak, to getting children to have dialogue, uh, retelling, using language, um, the language, the new words that they've learned and building friendships through that, playing, uh, but making sure that they have opportunities and um, supports, enhancements, adaptations made to the curriculum so that they can uh, actively engage in all the opportunities and experiences that are provided during the day. You know, and can I add, you know, there, there are these open questions about what is effective in, in situations where there are multiple languages represented or, or even when there are just one or two, you know, if, if you're not, exclusively trained to work in a dual language setting, you know, what are you supposed to do? Those are open questions, mm -hmm. certainly. And, 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 you know, I just wanted to plug that National Academies report that we've talked about a couple of times because um, what this group of researchers has done is looked at the evidence base as it stands today and they've identified, I think, eight to 10 practices that any educator in an early childhood setting can be incorporating into their practice um, that has particular benefits for dual language learners. Um, and, and there's a practitioner toolkit that the National Academies has come out with. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's limited, but it's, it's something, it's beginning. And so it's, there's the, there are the beginnings, I think, of a conversation about how to tra take what's happening in policy and in research and bring it down to the ground in practice. Mm -hmm. the, other, um, the other resource that's coming down the pike in the next couple of years is, or next year or so, is um, the Migration Policy Institute, which is a think tank in DC, is looking at um, what evidence there is around uh, this notion of super diversity. So in those settings where multiple languages are represented, what are tools and tactics that um, early childhood programs across the country have used um, effectively to, uh, to, to sort of 
decrease uh, barriers to education for um, diverse children. And so they'll be coming out with that from a research perspective soon, and then the hope is to translate that um, from, research for, uh, from research to practitioners. And so again, the, the conversation is starting to happen, but, but there is this real need for resources to connect um, policy to practice to research and all along that trajectory. And I guess I would be fired if I did not call out that American Institute Research will be you know, publishing something through um, our first five California investment in regards to the pilots. And that can also serve as providing some supports and, and providing some, some more information of how to scale this throughout the state. And I think that's the difficult part is as we're talking about these key ingredients of what this looks like based on the setting, based on the model, based on the languages, we have to forget that the parent engagement is at the core. Even though we would want the best as our approach, interviewing that parent from day one and finding out what their thoughts are around language with that little infant from day one is very important because that's foundational to what we're going to do as far as strategies and supports. Thank you. Um, another thing that the National Academies study talks about is uh, the importance of paying attention to uh, language loss. Right? Can you talk a little bit about, so we know in certain settings, English is going to be uh, the, the language of the, of the instruction. Um, and we know that there's strategies that can support home language. Uh, but one of the things that we know is uh, we're learning more about the, the ramifications of language loss of, of the home language. So can you talk a little bit about that and thinking about what we need to be paying attention to when we have the opportunity for a bilingual class and what do we need to be paying attention to for when you have a class supported by a fabulous teacher who's monolingual English and, and what are the tools that need to be in her toolbox um, to sort of take this language loss issue in mind? Well, the whole language loss issue, um, we, we don't have that much information about it relative to young children. Most of that um, research is with adolescents. Um, but we do know, and the National Academy does showcase the whole issue of children losing language very quickly. Many of you who have worked with young children, um, they can lose their language in one year. I have seen cases uh, where a teacher will have the parents of the preschooler come to her because the child is refusing to speak the home language and cannot communicate with her parents at age four. These are very serious um, issues because it's not just about language, it's about the, the, the mental health of this family. And so the adolescent research shows you this, this, this back and forth that the teenagers have with language loss um, in that they really are unable to communicate with their, with their parents. And many of you may be working with immigrant parents and those parents are complaining about their teeners. Mm -hmm. Teeners don't communicate really well with your parents anyway, but when you have <laughs> language loss, um, it, it exacerbates that. And there is some work that shows how it can lead to very negative outcomes in, in, uh, from the adolescent period. In early childhood, we have less information about that. However, we do know that young children learn about the values and cultures and the socialization practices uh, from their parents. And that parents, when they can no longer communicate with their child, have a loss, they, they feel out of control. They're no longer in the role of a parent. The child then becomes the parent in that instant. So there's a lot of socio-emotional confusion mm -hmm. that can result from language loss. And so that's one of the major, one of the main reasons to support the home language. And if it's a monolingual, in, you know, the fact of the matter is, and when I was teaching at Cal State, many of my, ch my students were uh, English was their second language, and I would say to them, I don't care if you're bilingual Spanish English, you're gonna go to the San Gabriel Valley and you're gonna have Korean speakers and you're gonna have all kinds of different Armenian speakers in, in, in Glendale. 
you know, we all have to learn to deal with dual language learners. And there are strategies, and this is brought out in the National Academy Report, the bulk of our teaching workforce will not know the home language of their children. So the question is, what are the strategies that those teachers can use to help the children feel that their language and their culture is important? And, and one of the big issues for me is attitude mm -hmm. of the teacher towards the second language speaker and the attitude towards their family. And using families, as Cora, Cora, Carola has said, and as Lupe has said, they're the first informants of their children. And, and we're really pretty good in early childhood about doing that, about reaching out to families and finding out about families. So there are things that can be done by monolingual English-speaking teachers to support the language and culture of their children who's whose language is not English when they come to them. Thank you. Well, that is all the time we have. We can talk, we actually do talk about this for hours and hours. Um, it's, <laughs> we are just scratching the surface on this conversation. But I wanna thank our panelists for um, raising the, uh, Ms. Chandasi and, uh, and Marlene, raising the conversation about building the momentum, the research and the policy, and then being able to hear from on the ground experiences of what's happening in our uh, in Fresno, in the QRS, in the quality conversation, as well as what's happening in higher ed, and steps that are being taken to move the needle and, and get us further along in, in learning the things we need to learn and building the tools we need to build so that we can put those in the hands of, of the field who wants to have those tools and wants to give an amazing early care and education and set kids up for success. So we have some work to do to build more of those, those tools, but we have some hopeful and promising practices that we can already build on. So thank, help me thank our guests, our, our panelists. And we are finally giving you a break. <laughs> so <laughs> we have a short break, and then we will come back on with our final panel, to, and then to send you on your way home. Thank you so much.